Welcome. It's my pleasure to kick off the 2021-22 Geology Lecture Series. And believe it or not, I am coming to you live from the Geology Lab in Umpqua Hall. So the last time we hosted an outside speaker, I was coming to you live from my office in Colito Hall. And over the summer, we have transitioned. So I know a lot of you haven't had an opportunity to see the new digs. So I thought we would just take a second and it's not quite the same as the real thing, but that we do just kind of a quick pan through the geology lab. And unfortunately, while you can wander through the building a little bit and we're hosting classes in here, uh, the lecture series is gonna remain virtual for the foreseeable future, but we've got a really great lineup. November 9th at 7 p.m. we'll be joined by Dr. Brendan Riley an IODP distinguished lecturer from Scripps. He'll be talking about revealing rhythms of ice ages with paleomagnetism. Then on January 26 at 7 p.m., we'll be joined by Dr. Chris Goldfinger of Oregon State for the 17th annual Cascadia anniversary lecture. And our ability to go virtual allows us to get Chris on the anniversary of the last Cascadia event. Then the next one we have scheduled, February 8th, uh, we've got uh, somebody we had scheduled before COVID, Dr. Sean Davis from NOAA, and he'll be talking about lessons at the School of Hard Knocks from the ozone hole to global climate change. And I'm working on a few more surprises to round out the year. I also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, the College and College Foundation for their continued support, the Mill, DB Western, the Ocean Discovery Lecture Series and our tech team, and of course, all the speakers, and of course, all of you. So hopefully you'll have an opportunity one of these days to come in and see these things up close and personal. This is pretty cool. Uh, our past, one of our previous plant services guys was on the Glomar Challenger, and that's from the original tour. And some of you may be familiar with Mike and Betsy Groban, over here, some great mining memorabilia that Mike had collected over the years. So we'll go back to center a little bit, but that's a little bit of the new digs for you. Tonight, it is my uh, pleasure, and we are so fortunate to be able to host Dr. David Blunk from Oregon State University. Uh, as a graduate student and early career scientist, uh, Dr. Blunk has been recognized by numerous universities as well as organizations as an outstanding scientist. A lot of those include student and early career, but uh, goes beyond that as well. If I were to list his accomplishments, uh, we wouldn't have time for the talk, so we will uh, move on from there. But he has at Oregon State established the Combustion Ignition Radiation and Energy Lab, along with co-founding their propulsion lab as well. His research will provide insight to a problem uh, that has become increasingly deadly in the Pacific Northwest and elsewhere, and that's wildfires. One quick quote that stuck with me uh, that I heard that David had mentioned was, if you wanna understand how to control wildfire or contain it or prevent it, it's helpful to know how it spreads. Join me in welcoming Dr. David Blunk as we learn more about this timely topic with wildfires and the role of firebrands in their spread. David? Oh, one more thing before we go to David. If you have any questions, please type them in. We'll be monitoring the chat box as well. So if you're wondering about anything, we're still going to try and do some Q&A. I did get a few that were emailed to me before the talk. Sorry for that interruption. Now back to David. All right. Well, Ron, thank you so much. Um, I'll confess after that, that fun video and uh, your introduction and your tour around your lab, uh, I almost want to change majors or at least come take a class from you. So uh, I appreciate your energy and, and the opportunity to, to join you tonight. So um, so as I said, I'm David Blunk, and I'm an associate professor at Oregon State University in the College of Engineering. And I'm grateful today to talk to you about work about firebrands. And I'll talk a bit more about what they are and their role in wildfires. Um, but literally, and pun intended, it's, it's become a more and more hot topic um, and before I begin, I need to acknowledge, uh, certainly, frankly, the people who did the, the most of the work, in particular, Tyler Hudson, 
uh, he was the first student that I worked with that really did the research. And some of the slides I'm sharing and, and some of the plots are work of his. And then also Sam Path Adamasili, he's a postdoc that I'm working with and some of the material that um, took directly from his slides. There's been two fun organizations, you can read those there. And then uh, as with just about all great research, there's been a lot of collaborations, both direct or indirect, that have made all this work possible. So I am a bit of the, the face tonight that gets to talk to you about it, but there's a lot of people who've helped make this happen. And I am very, very grateful to, to be able to work with them. All right. Um, as I started preparing for this presentation tonight, I, uh, I remembered an experience that I had when I was in graduate school. Um, and, and this experience, frankly, was fairly common for me. So about once a week, we'd have a lecture series and we go and they bring in some uh, professor in the engineering field. And I remember one particular occasion, the speaker was talking about um, how they model mathematically, uh, if you took a cable and were laying a cable down along the floor of the ocean, so think naval applications, if you're laying this cable down, how will that cable get deformed? And basically we look at it and think, well, that looks like a bunch of knots. And I remember seeing this image of this piece of cable that is being put up in a knot. And then I remember waking up. And I remember basically, I don't remember his name. I just remember the image and then falling asleep. And I couldn't tell you a thing he said other than that one image. And frankly, I could hardly remember a lot of the presentations I sat through. So I thought, all right, what can I do today that would be useful um, for this audience? Ron told me this audience may be fairly diverse. So what can I say that could be useful to a broad audience, both those who are interested scientifically, maybe younger audience, older audience, and so let me outline my goals tonight, and I, I hope I can stick to them in, in my presentation. So frankly, my first goal tonight is, is it possible, I hope to inspire younger or younger at heart um, people, whether it be engineers, um, in the STEM, liberal arts, whatever, to use your gifts and talents to address global challenges. For me, one of the things that resonated with engineering is I felt like I could try to make a difference in the world, and that's led me to research, and now the research you're doing today. But I very much think about how, what am I doing is going to make an impact. And uh, I don't have to preach to this crowd how many challenges are out there. And, and I think we need, we need a rising generation to help us address those. Another goal tonight, uh, even if wildfire is not your thing, you could care less. I, what I want to illustrate is the process, at least that I've taken, to take something that is arguably, arguably very complicated, wildfires, and how we've been able to simplify and systematically be able to learn aspects that relate to wildfires. So you can almost think of this as a case study tonight about one researcher and approach to understanding complex topics. For those who are into wildfires, I want to provide new insights into firebrand production and generation. I want to wrap up um, with suggestions for homeowners. Um, so if nothing else, if you have a home, please pay attention. Uh, hopefully I give some advice about how we can better protect our houses from firebrands and for uh for everybody else maybe you like to watch a few videos or watch things burn whether boy scout or modern boy scout or former boy scout um there's going to be some fun what i think are fun videos and fun images of the burns we've done so hopefully tonight i can address all of those goals okay so first of all um let me provide a little bit of motivation for why we care about firebrands I'm going to play, play a video and we'll see Ron I'll have to jump in and tell me if you can hear the video, the sound on this. But uh, if, if the sound works, it's, it's, this is from the Discovery Channel. They show a video about a fire spread this up in Canada and you're going to see basically what looks like rain, but it's burning pieces of material. So hopefully you can hear that. Can you hear that? Can you hear that? Can you hear that? Yeah, that probably won't work so well. <laughs> so um, you can see the video right here. There's this, uh, these trees that were burning. I think it was black spruce. The firefighters talking about how just frankly like challenge it is. And now you see these bits of burning material that are coming down as these people are, are evacuating. So this piece of burning material are known as firebrands or embers. And they can come down, and if they land on flammable material, can, material can start new fires. So think of it, wherever rain can go, you have these firebrands that can start new fires. 
and he describes how they it jumped um, a river that was close by and it went about about a half a kilometer, I think about a quarter of a mile or so. These are some infrared videos that a student took named Tyler Hudson. Um, this is burning of juniper. So you can see the flames and you can see the pieces of burning material firebrands that are being released. And so my work is focused on studying these. And in some cases, they could be the major driver in why fire spread. Bringing a bit closer to home, if you remember the Eagle Creek fire up in the Columbia River Gorge in 2017, in fact, if you drive the gorge, you can see the charred trees um, uh, near the Multnomah Falls. Um, as part of that fire, there's actually a fire that, that um, started on the Washington side, jumped the Columbia River and started a new fire. So how does that happen? It's a wildfire. It wasn't a wall of flames. Excuse me. How did that happen? It was a firebrand. It wasn't a wall of flames that made that happen. Um, and many major fires, whether it be in the woods, so to speak, um, or even in an urban center can be driven by the spread of these firebrands. So when the fire community thinks about firebrands, there's really three processes that, that are used to think about it. The first is generation of ember. So obviously you have to form an ember as the fuel burns. The second part of the process is that those firebrands or embers are lofted and transported. So they get taken up by the wind, they move down downwind, they still need to be burning. They can then come down and under the right conditions can call what's called a spot fire. And note, there can be a large gap between where the main fire is and where the spot fire is. And in many instances, then these two fires will grow together. And so my research has focused primarily on ember generation and specifically, how do we, how do we, or what can we do to better understand what controls the generation of embers? The community has been wrestling with both the number of firebrands that are generated and how that changes depending on the terrain, the moisture content of the species. But, but frankly, a lot of our work have been go out and collect data and report it. Go out and collect data and report it, but not, uh, we don't have enough insight that, historic, that historically, we haven't had enough insight that we could step back and say, all right, well, for this situation, we would expect that Douglas fir are burning and so they would produce more firebrands or less. Or, um, it's, it's especially dry. So here's how it's going to change fire red. We just haven't had insight into that. So today I'm going to talk to you about the work that we've taken over multiple scales to help us better understand this concept of ember generation and what controls it. And so to put this work in perspective, I just want to briefly highlight some of the research that other people have done before us. So some work has gone on looking at very canonical laboratory scale experiments. And it was basically they had a burner, they would take a dowel, they would heat the dowel, uh, measure the stress or what it took to break it and say, well, here's what we can learn about firebrands because ultimately you have these burning materials that break off and so they kind of replicate a, a portion of that. Next, there's been work that has looked at, I'll call it tree scale. So they'll take trees about the size of a Christmas tree or a tall Christmas tree and they'll burn it, they've burned them and then they've collected all the firebrands that have been released. Usually it's in trays of water they put around, around the trees. And that type of work has typically been, we burned this tree and here's what we measured or observed. And we like that because it's a larger scale, um, but it's challenging, you know, cause and effect. And on the larger, on the other end of it, people have gone out after wildfires have swept through communities and have taken trampoline mats that were damaged but not burned, taken those back to the lab and have actually measured the size of the, the burn marks in the trampoline mat and used that to, to extract information about the firebrands. So the culmination of all this work is that the community has identified that the species of tree, the size, the diameter of, of the fuel, the fuel loading, how hot the fire is burning, the moisture content, certainly wind, all influence the generation of firebrands. But what the community historically hasn't understood and has wrestled with is how important are all these parameters? Is one parameter more important than another and so on? And so that sets the stage for the work I'm gonna to talk to you tonight. And the work that we've done is we've tried to do a multi-scale approach. So tonight I'm gonna to talk to you about a branch scale. You can think about like a laboratory type experiment. I'm gonna to talk to you about tree scale Again, think about burning something like a Christmas tree size. And I'll talk to you just briefly about a forest scale and some of the work we've done uh, to address it. 
And obviously, as you go from left to right, the complexity increases and our ability to control the experiment uh, decreases, but also becomes more relevant. And so we're trying to, to, to find that compromise or extract information of the different scales. All right, so let me talk to you tonight, starting with branch scale study. And so the objectives of the work that I'm gonna show is number one, is we wanted to understand how a fuel species affects the time to ember generation. So if I have a piece of burning mater uh, material, I put it in a flame, how does the species of that stick of wood influence generation? We also wanted to better, better understand which physical parameters, think about moisture content, think about the heat of the flame, the wind speed influences generation. And then also we wanted to better understand if I take something that's harvested in the woods and take it and burn it or something that's been processed, think about lumber, how does that influence burning behavior? Okay, so we did a, a 2K factorial study. So our value we measured is we took sticks of wood, we would stick them in a wind tunnel with a large flame, and we'd measure how long it took until those uh, pieces of material would break off and go downstream. And I'll show a video of that here shortly. And so we varied things like moisture content, the species, there's four species that we studied. I looked, we looked at the diameter, we looked at six millimeter or two millimeter, and also the fuel condition. Was it a dowel? So think about going to heart, uh, Home Depot, you buy a sample, you mill it down to the right size, or natural branches or, that, we, that we harvested and burned. So we burned all these, we measured the time to generation, and we varied the different parameters. We also varied how hot the air was that was flowing over the, the, the sticks. Think about we varied the flame, so to speak. And then we also varied how fast air was going through the wind tunnel between about six and three meters per second. Okay, so this is just a quick illustration of our setup. We took a camera, we inserted our samples, and there was essentially a flame that was anchored right here. And then with a the camera, we measured how long it took from the time of being inserted into the flow to actually breaking off and generated an ember. We said, okay, well, those, th those that generate embers more quickly are more likely to generate firebrands. And this will just show you a video. This is a video of that process. So these are firebrands that have been burning. We have obviously have the flame. And so you can think essentially we have a stop clock going and we're quantifying how long it takes to break off. And we see deflection. Uh, interesting to me, sometimes actually deflected downward and then they break off. And so at some point here soon, you'll see it break off. And then at that point, we stop our stopwatch and we say, all right, so this species generated a firebrand this long for these conditions. So we'd say, all right, so it generated a firebrand. Okay, so I'm gonna get right into the results. There's a statistical analysis behind it, but I won't bore you with that tonight. So this will give you the sense of the, what we learned from our branch scale study. So what I'm showing here, this is called the mean square. The mean, oops, excuse me. So the mean square is just um, a measure of how important that parameter is. So use statistics, you could say, is it really influence our results or not? And we measure the diameter, we vary the diameter, temperature, velocity, moisture content, and species. And to my, what, to my surprise, frankly, the most important parameter that influenced the generation of firebrands was the diameter of our stick or dowel that we burned. The second most important was the species. And then really to my surprise, number, I guess, uh, four on that list, so to speak, is the temperature. Over the range of temperatures that we studied that didn't have a substantial influence on the time to generation, and then even the velocity of the flow didn't make a big difference. Now, we surely could have varied go over larger extremes. And maybe the results will be different, but at least within the values that we studied, it didn't tend to have a big influence. And there's certainly a lot of other results, but this gives you a flavor of the type of analysis and, and what we were learning from this process. So what I'm showing here, this is the time to generation in seconds. So we'll say on the order of about 30 seconds or so for some of our work. These are six millimeter diameter dowels, so pieces of wood. And then we have Douglas fir, ponderosa pine, western juniper, and white oak. What we find is for those six millimeter, that Douglas fir generated the most readily, fairly, uh, not much longer, much, 
<laughs> not long after that, so to speak, we'd have ponderosa pine that generate, and then western juniper would take the longest to generate firebrands. Where it gets interesting is, oh, so there's density. Where it gets interesting is now, here are the results for our two millimeter size samples. What we find is that for the, the smaller uh, dowels, or you can think about a smaller branch, then the species dependence tends to wash out. So what that teaches us is that there's a size um, threshold, so to speak, that for certain sizes, firebrands generate, um, are not as influenced by different parameters like species that, uh, of this tree or wood, but for, uh, but for larger sizes, then other parameters become more important. But those results are not limited just to the species of trees. Um, this is the results. These are, again, for six millimeter uh, dowels, time generation, and this is just saying we went to high and low values. So we varied the cross flow, and then also uh, that's this orange. So we went from low velocity to the high velocity, and we saw a decrease in time as you'd expect. We also varied the moisture content, and so there's some sensitivity to that parameter for the six millimeter. And then when we look at the results for two millimeter again, again, we see that insensitivity or lack of sensitivity to the parameters depend on the size of the firebrand, or sorry, the size of the dowel. The last uh, piece that I will show from this study, we went and repeated these results for Douglas fir, and we took our dowel, so these are essentially results I've shown you before, and then we also shared results from natural. So then we try to find a, a branch that had about the same di diameter, again, a two millimeter, or six millimeter, and what we found was that our natural branch that still had the bark was from the edge of the tree, not from the heartwood, which is where our lumber would come from, increased by about 50%, at least for our six millimeter. And it did increase notably even for our two millimeter samples. So what that suggests is that natural fuels, um, depending on the species, can be less prone to burn ignite and generate fire brands compared to, to natural species. And so that gives insight into researchers like me to say, Great, you can go collect and burn all day samples you get from Home Depot, but you need to be aware of that, that Mother Nature has some um, added complexity to it. So I've given you a uh, snapshot of, of, of results that we collected. What does this all boil down to? And for a while, we were really scratching our heads about, well, how, what's the takeaway message? You know, what's the message that we would share to a, a, our sponsor or to someone who works in wildfire? Uh, the details here would just get washed out, right? And so at least from my perspective, here's how I think it boils down. And so here's the conclusions. You could read those, but, but this is what I want to point out. As we wrestled with, so it depends on the diameter, it depends on the species, most importantly. Well, what controls the diameter? At the end of the day, it's really the species. The species influences the geometry of the trees. Uh, as a side comment, for us engineers, we call it the branchiness. We we're told that's not correct, but for this audience, maybe I'll call it the branchiness of the trees. So, for example, uh, ponderosa pine has a much thicker stem on its branches at the very edge of the canopy compared to something like Douglas fir. And so, the dia the characteristic diameter of the trees are influenced by the species. And then we also note that just the composition of the species influences it. So, of all the work that we looked at within within our range we found the species type of this is the most important parameter influencing firebrand generation. Now, we can do studies of larger velocities of wind and that sort of thing, but these are the results that, that we found. Okay, so I've given results for branch scale. Now, certainly we realize that this is a, a well-controlled laboratory experiment, and there's a big difference between our wind tunnel and something that's happened in, uh, in the forests of Oregon or, or throughout the world. So that led to what I'm going to characterize as a tree scale burn. For reference, this fan right here is probably about nine feet tall. So the results I'm going to show are for trees that are on the order of about 12 feet tall um, or four meters tall for those that, that prefer metric. And I'll talk a bit more about that work. But our goal really was to say, all right, so we studied individual branches. How do these results extend to tree scales or do they not extend? Great, we need to know that as well. All right, so essentially that's what I just highlighted there. 
for reference, so again, here's that same fan I described. That's maybe nine feet or so. So we're looking at, this is, looks like there's five trees in the study. I believe these are Douglas fir. And uh, so now we have flames that are probably 20, 25 feet tall. Okay, so how do we design this so we can learn something useful about firebrand generation? So here's our setup. So we had a straw bed. And then in that straw bed, we would place one, three, or five trees. And then downstream, downwind, uh, yeah, it wouldn't burn well if it was downstream. Uh, but we did downwind, and so it would burn. Uh, we place sheets of fire resistant fabric or trays of water at several locations uh, downwind of where the trees were. And we obviously couldn't control the wind. This is all outdoors at our outdoor test location. So our way to control the wind was basically not test if it was windy. <laughs> and so we went back and measured it. It's, it's about one meter per second or less. So very little wind. And, and then we would burn, we'd start, um, we'd ignite it at one end, the fire propagate towards the trees and then generate the firebrands. Okay, so there's the detail. And then um, I'm gonna share at least initially results for Douglas fir, Grand fir, Ponderosa pine and Western juniper. So this is to give you a video of one of our burns. This is of a Western juniper. You see the flame propagating forward. It begins to go, they call this the ladder fuel. So some of the lower branches start to burn. That then leads to flames impinging on adjacent branches. Um, this didn't always burn like this, but, um, but when it completely torched, the branches let, and the flames of the branches lead to another branch and then ultimately the entire thing would torch. If you look closely, you might be able to see pieces of material that essentially are floating down and then landing down on our trays of water or fa fabric that's treated with the fire, resist fire retardant. Um, if you can hear the sound, I'd play this, but you won't. So uh, we've had several media outlets have come and taken pictures. And I guess you have words here. So I'll let you watch this. This won't take too long. Um, but they came out to, to better understand our work. Uh, so this is a study of ponderosa pine. They're outlining the significance of that work or why we, we care about it. And that would be a, a group, I think, of five hundred of pine. And we want to see if I have a cluster of them, how does that change our firebrand generation? It's all done on a gravel um, found pad, essentially. And we are in contact with our local fire department. And, and there's the firebrand obviously is not in place. So we're making sure that everyone's happy, uh, <laughs> okay, with us doing all of our burning. That also gives you a sense of the, the scale of where we see the firebrands are distributed. Okay, so after the burn, the firebrands or embers that were in trays were taken, they were dried out, put on a piece of paper and then photographed. Now what's interesting, what was novel about this work is the fabric we use is treated with a fire retardant. And so firebrands that come down are cold, don't leave a mark. But those that are still hot come down and actually leave a char mark on it. And so one way to think of this is that we have measurements of the hot firebrands by char marks. Whereas the other firebrands, the firebrands that are collected in sheets of water are the total number of firebrands. And arguably, you could say we don't care about the majority of them. And I'll have some work to back that up. All right. And then we do image processing. We back out the size and the number of the, the char marks. And there's been a lot of analysis that's, that's gone into, into that. Okay. So I'll get into some example of those results. So let me orient you here. So this is sheets of trays of water. We averaged them at, for different distances. Think of different um, radiuses away from the trees. And this is a number flux. So this is the number of fire brands per meter squared. So we have a little area like this. So it's the number of fire brands, or excuse me, the embers to total um, hot and cold that come down in that area. And so initially when we're fairly close to the tree, we're getting about uh, 1500 pieces of embers per meter squared. And then that decreases as we go out radially as we'd expect. And also embedded here is species dependence. So we have the results for the different four species that we study. And I'll talk about that more here shortly. 
I just removed the uncertainty bars, can be a bit cleaner to look at. Already we can see that ponderosa pine, shown here in the very bottom left-hand corner, compared to things like grand fir and western juniper, um, there can be arguably a large difference in the number of these firebrands that are generated. Again, think back to our conclusion from the tree, from our branch scale, a species dependence. And that so far, this result suggests that's consistent. Now what I'm showing you are the results for char marks. So this is, as I said earlier, essentially the total number of hot firebrands that leave marks per meter squared. So already we can see a difference. On the plot on the left, we're having on the order about 1,500 embers uh, per meter squared. If we look at just the char marks, we're going down to less than 400. So we're seeing a difference between the total number, which historically the community has reported and the number that we are um, measure and identifying. Also, we can begin to get insight in the, the different species dependence. Again, ponderosa pine tends to produce fewer of the hot uh, firebrands, and then western juniper and grand fir tend to produce um, the most. One of the things, just a side comment, one of the things that was intriguing to me, um, and those who know the forest will, will, you're welcome to laugh at me because I, I can't hear you. <laughs> um, Initially, I thought, well, Grand Fir and Douglas Fir <coughs> are, are basically the same tree. And I, I told a, a, a friend who has a forest degree, and he almost he just laughed at me like, no, they're different trees. But, but they're from basically the same forest and uh, both relatively short needles. Uh, and you can harvest them in the forest locally here uh, around Corvallis. And if you look at Grand Fir and Douglas Fir, to me, the, the, the naive rookie engineer, same tree but their burning behavior and the firebrand production um, is, is markedly different between that. And I don't have an answer for that, but I think that was um, a fascinating side comment that, or side aspect that, that we picked up. All right, so what else did we learn? So we also backed up information about the size of the embers. So this would be the length of the ember and then the diameter of the ember from based on pictures or estimates. And so, and the, the, why we care about this is we also want to understand what is essentially these, these firebrands or objects that come down. If we want to predict if they're going to cause ignition, we need to know their size because their energy content will be related to their size. So we want to know basically what's going to be in the air. If we understand the size, we can better predict how they'll be transported through the air and then ultimately come down and cause new fires. So we have results for Douglas for Grand Fur. In this case, the results are similar. Ponderosa pine, different animal. And then we have our Western Juniper. We have similar results looking at the size of char marks. Note the size becomes different because we're looking at just the char marks. But then if you look at the distribution, Douglas fir, grand fir, relatively similar. Note ponderosa pine goes from a distribution that tends to be very long with small diameter. If you look at char marks, it tends to be fairly uh, equally distributed between the, the length and the diameter of the char mark. And then we have the results for Western juniper. So if you look at this, note that Western juniper, well, I guess some of these species, you can get relatively large char marks in areas. Um, certainly when we observed it, the Western juniper burned the most intensely of the species uh, of the, in this test campaign right here. Okay, so the other layer that we wanted to look at is said, well, great, so we can get numbers. What we'd like to do is to be able to better understand how we could use this type of information in a model or, um, We'd like to know of the actual amount of tree that burns, how much that it is used to generate embers. And so what we've done, we did <coughs> is we measured the mass of the tree that was burned. There's a certain part that's released from the moisture, but they wanted to say, well, of the tree, you know, we have initial weight and final weight, how many firebrands are produced with that? Okay. So that's what's shown here is a number of flux. Again, think about number of flux, and this is just averaged out per kilogram or think about they'd be corollary to pounds of the, uh, these different species. So what we find is that per amount of the tree that is consumed, Douglas fir tends to produce the most firebrands, followed by grand fir, ponderosa pine, and western juniper. Now this is for embers, these are all of them. If we look at the char marks, which is what I think is most important, these are the hot ones, it's a bit of a different story. Of the char marks, you're going to get grand fur per pound or per kilogram is going to produce more char marks per area, followed by western juniper, 
Douglas fir, and then ponderosa pine. Again, we're seeing a species dependence. And what's interesting is these are three species that can coexist essentially at the same location, the, the same um, habitat. So you can get a very large spread even for the same forest type, so to speak. The other part to this is now I'm showing results for the char to ember ratio. So how many char marks per ember mark do we detect? So we find that Western juniper basically for every one in three firebrands produced comes down and is still relatively hot. And on the other extreme, we have ponderosa pine where only less than one in 10 of all the firebrands that are released for our fires are going to produce ones that are hot. Now, I think it's important to note that a um, major limitation of our study is just frankly the size of the fire and the size of our trees. The, tr the, the fires they're gonna frankly get uh, national media attention, <laughs> national media attention, or gonna cause uh, responders concern are really big trees torching, um, higher, there's wind. And so it may be that these results shift if we're able to burn more of the bark or more of the, of the needles. Our fire intensity are just not sufficient to really evaluate that. So that's certainly a limitation. And I would also argue though, that you gotta start somewhere and some information is better than no information, which was really the before what, the, the condition before we started our study. Okay, so let me tell you the, the conclusions. Again, you could read these, but consistent with our branch scale studies, the species type we found was the most important parameter influencing ember generation. Now, we certainly need to verify this for changes in the wind speed. Um, for an experimentalist, that is incredibly challenging because I can't control the wind. And there's so many other variables, you wanna change only one thing at a time. And so I haven't thought of a way to do that consistently here at my resources. Now, there are locations where they have large scale wind tunnels. They've done some work, um, and I've had conversations with them and, and typically the answer is, oh, very, we're very interested, great research. Um, we'll see if something works out. So it hasn't yet, but, but hopefully that changes. Okay, now I'm gonna pause now and uh, if you will pick apart the research that we've done up to that point. And so I wanna ask this question. So what, what are we lacking in that, that work I've just gone over? And I, I want to draw your attention to this plot right here. This information I think is useful in understanding the physics of what's happening. But if we wanna take it one step further and say, well, how can we use work coming out of Oregon State or frankly other groups, if we wanna take their work and use it to predict or understand like a, um, a threat, evaluate the threat. So here's this forest, here's this composition. What's the threat from that forest? Or if we wanna build a model, taking results like this is very challenging. And, and the reason for that is because I can give you a, a number in an area, but what we want to do is to know a number from a tree or from a branch or a shrub. And the results that we've, I've shown and frankly other people have shown don't get to that. And so what are we lacking? It's an ability to incorporate the results into models. The use of per kilogram how much of the fuel is consumed, that's that step towards using the models because models can predict how much of a tree will burn, but they need to know, well, if I've burned this much of a tree, a number that will be released, okay? So I would really like to, to, to take that next step so that the work that's being done is being useful for folks is to look at this embers being released for the amount of fuel consumed, like a total number. So I, I, I launch, I release 50 if I burn one pound. Right, and then my model can then track where those go. So that's really what our work and work previous to ours was lacking. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. So uh, that led us to, to pause and say, all right, so we felt good about the work we've done, but really what could we do to take it the next step further? And I'm fortunate, uh, I'm grateful that we got additional funding. And so basically we went back and repeated the experiments that I just discussed, but, but made a few key changes. Um, and most importantly is instead of having 15 sheets of fire resistant fabric, we deployed them at 65 locations and more recently over, I think it was 75, 70, 75, all uh, spaced out in front of these firebrands, or sorry, in front of this tree. And so we repeated our experiments, but now we had a much better region where we could collect these firebrands 
And then we could still back out a char marks per meter squared or number of hot firebrands per meter squared. We still have that information, but now we better understand how that varies over a, a train. And this is just an example of, we also burn larger trees. This is, I believe one of our 20 foot tall trees. So about six to seven meters tall. Those are fun, <laughs> but frankly, even um, winter next one, they seem tall, but out in the forest, they seem really small. It's, it's funny how the, the scale changes. All right, but we burn these trees and then using that char marks per meter squared, we then integrate it. So those who have our taking calculus, what I'm showing right here is these are uh, the numbers that we measured, these open symbols, the numbers we measured. This is the location where the tree is. So we see near the tree, there's more char marks per meter squared and it decreases. We then fit, we create a distribution to say, all right, so on average then, based on what we measure, what's our distribution? And then we integrated that, think about calculus, we integrated that to get us a, estimate a total number of firebrands. Now, one of our assumptions that all the firebrands go in front, so to speak, of the tree, that's not always the case you've come to find out, um, but I think in general that, that that's a, a reasonable assumption. So we evaluated different integration techniques. That's not important for this discussion tonight, but just to recognize that we took our work one step further and ultimately been able to estimate a total number of firebrands that were released as we burned our trees. Okay, so now what I'm showing, let me draw your attention to this plot up here. We burned different heights of trees, as I said earlier, and this is the number of firebrands, so hot char marks, total number per amount of fuel that is consumed per kilogram. Now, these are results that are uh, close to being able to be used inside models. Um, for those who do modeling, think of this as a source term. These are source term type information. Now, I've had conversations with modeling folks and one group said, oh yeah, we're gonna use your work. One group said, well, I, I still need this information. I think they're a little skeptical. And someone else, oh, that's good. So one group is supposed to be using this and I'm sure I'm lacking, I know I'm lacking some information that they want, but um, I think this is really close to what the, the modeling folks need. Now, let me draw your attention. In this study, we also burned sagebrush and went back to Douglas fir and ponderosa pine. So what we know is that, I wanna draw I guess, two, two things. So one, here we have Douglas fir and ponderosa pine. Again, Douglas fir produced more of these hot fire brands um, than a ponderosa pine. And then here are the results for sagebrush. Certainly per kilogram that's burned, sage produce, sagebrush produces more hot fire brands. Not to caution everybody that remember that you're gonna burn more mass of a Douglas fir than sagebrush. There's just a lot more of a Douglas fir tree than a sagebrush. So you have to be cautious and just look at the results. You have to think over a certain um, uh, scale, how much per, how much of that species would be consumed, okay? Um, we also looked at the moisture content to begin to understand or estimate how the number of firebrands changes that are produced, these source terms. Um, what we found and what you'd expect is that the number of hot firebrands decreases as the moisture content increases. Now with these two results for sagebrush and, and frankly, we, we don't have a good answer for that yet and, and maybe there's no answer, <laughs> um, but that is the data that, that, that we found. I will note though that for the same moisture content that sagebrush tends to produce more hot firebrands than the other, other species that we studied. Uh, since the results that I'm showing here, we've gone on to measure for chemise, and chemise is important uh, in particular for Southern Oregon and then a lot of California. And think, you can think about a lot of the lush forests, at least in the, my part of the, the state. You go down south, you have these lush, or maybe not lush, <laughs> uh, meadows of, of chemise. It's part of the chaparral ecosystem. All right. And I have a whole slew of other results that we've done or in the process of analyzing, looking at these source terms. But for the sake of time, I'm not going to go over those tonight. Again, I want to highlight that we see this consistent trend, a, a species dependence on the number of firebrands. And depending on the species, we've collected data for that. We can provide those for modeling or for people who are interested to inform, um, I guess, their, their, their mitigation type strategies. 
All right. In my introduction, I mentioned just briefly that the, frankly, the holy grail is to understand at four scale. There's some work out in the community. One of the challenges is cause and effect. We can go out and even that's challenging, but we, in some cases, can go out and measure the number of firebrands that are released. But they're just numbers. Hey, for this fire, this burn, this is what we measure. But it, 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 it helps us compare results at other scales and see if we it's ballpark. I mean, and frankly, it's um, for lack of better we, we're spitballing to see if we're close. So I'm going to show you one or two slides here looking at four scale study that we participated in. A student went out. Uh, thanks to the Nature Conservancy of Oregon, they were allowed us to come out. They were deliberately burning Western juniper, wanted a torch. That's a great recipe for generating firebrands. So the student went out, deployed sheets of fire-resistant resi fabric. And what I'm showing right here, this is just different pieces of fabric from a tree scale study in the char mark area. We're just looking at the size of these char marks. And if we compare it, the average, it's about 65 uh, millimeter squared. If we compare it to our forest scale study, again, we don't have the amount of data, but it was a lot of work and very challenging to get this data that I'm showing here. Oops. Oop. I guess I don't have the average. We used to have the average. But if you look at this, so we're saying it's on the order of about 40. So what was our conclusion from this? That the results from our tree scale study um, can fall within the range of results we get from forest scale. Not that the results met, match by any means the four scale, but they can be representative of, of what we'd expect. Okay, so I want to recap and tie it all in together. So I outlined five goals in presenting tonight, and those that are with me, I, I appreciate you, you joining and sticking with me for tonight. Um, tonight, I've hoped to potentially inspire folks, whatever your talents and interest, to pick up a cause that can make a difference in the world. For me, my career has led me to, to dressing wildfires, trying to dress or better send wildfires. Just today, I was on a phone call um, with a lady who's on a board for the governor, and she's trying to better understand what technology can be used to control wildfires. And she asked basically for my help and a, a little a piece of that. Um, so maybe that's a way I could, another way I can make a difference in the world. You never know, but we have to think about what's the impact we can have and then work towards that. I also want us to paint this as a case study about a process for studying. I took something fairly complicated, generation of firebrands, and, and thought, well, how can I systematically uh, control and analyze and try to understand piece of the physics that occur at tree scales? Um, we've also talked through what we've been learning in Oregon State about firebrand production and generation. And hopefully I've been able to provide a few fun pictures and videos for those that uh, enjoy fire burning things and obviously controlled in safe manners. What I haven't talked about today is giving suggestions in homeowners. And so if you're a homeowner, could be a homeowner or we're a homeowner, uh, I encourage you to pay attention for the last five minutes, if you will. I have three things I wanna talk about tonight. What I wish every homeowner knew and acted upon. And this, um, this has evolved, and the urgency I felt in commuting, communicating this type of information has grown um, as I, I think I've matured in, in this field and had a few experiences, which I'll share. So number one is we as homeowners need to feel the responsibility for protecting our homes, not during an incident. Like, I don't think we should stay at home and do something, frankly, stupid. But we have responsibility before a fire event to protect our home. Human nature is to focus on what others can do, not what we need to do. This is readily apparent in interviews with media, media like to talk to folks from Oregon State, and usually questions go like, well, whose responsibility, who's at fault of this, or what does the US government need to do, it, do about this situation? And, and I don't disagree. But at the end of the day, I have very little influence on what they do, Maybe a better question that would be impact more people is, what do I need to do as a homeowner to make sure that my home and my family are as safe as possible? You can imagine an extreme case, of course, that if we all live in uh, concrete homes, homes would never burn down. Now, I'm not advocating for that. Um, I wouldn't be married right now if, if I advocated for that. Um, but you could see the extreme. Like We could take steps to help protect our home 
And as long as I realize like that's my responsibility, not someone else to come put it out, that changes the urgency that we feel, feel about it. Now, I'm going to throw myself under the bus. These are pictures that a student gave in a presentation. This is some mulch. These are leaves in a gutter or in a valley. It's leaves in a gutter. Leaves near home. These are pictures that a graduate student had in a presentation for my house. And he threw me under the bus with, with my blessing and basically said, hey, look, here's my advisor. And he's not taking care of his house, essentially, is, is what he was saying. And, and he was right. Um, I'm prone to think, oh, fire's not going to happen here. I don't need to worry about it or I'm too busy. Or there's a fire close by. I quickly get up on the roof and I can solve all my problems, right? It's easy to feel that to not feel that sense of urgency about wildfires. One thing that is helping me, I have a long ways to go, is what if our mindset is not if a wildfire is gonna happen, but what will this be the year or this be the month that there'll be a fire near my house? Now, those are on the Western side of Oregon, the wetter side. I, I didn't think of wildfires being a Western Oregon thing. That was always somewhere else, right? Like that's a California thing or a Central Eastern Oregon thing. If you look back at the, um, the history of fires, there have been some million acre fires in the Western side of Oregon. Western Oregon historically has had fires and it's part of mother nature. Now they're not as frequent as other parts of our country, but this area is prone to burn. And as we're seeing, it's more and more prone to burn. Uh, and there's lots of things we could talk about it, but at the end of the day, there's very little that I can control, but I can control my domain and there's steps that I can take to do it. So as a homeowner who lives next to a forest, um, I tried to get my mindset to shift this year. Will this be the year there's a fire on my hillside? And will, am I ready for that? So we need to take responsibility ownership and preparing uh, the, the phrase that uses firewise or do we have a resilient home? Will we be safe if there's an incident? Okay. All right. Now, what else do I wish every homeowner knew and acted upon? The second thing is we need to educate ourselves about fire spread. Let me tell you a story. Uh, last summer, there was the big fires. There was a fire that was near Malala, Oregon. My folks live in Canby, Oregon, which is about 20 minutes away. They went to level two evacuation. So as a <clears throat> trying to be a good son, and especially the son who studies wildfires, uh, I drove opposite of the, <laughs> the way traffic was going. I drove my parents' house. Um, and they were getting ready just in case they had to evacuate. Now, this is an aerial view of my parents' house. I don't know the date, but this probably could be any time of the year. My parents' goal in life was to recreate the Garden of Eden in Camby, Oregon. Uh, depending on who you ask, thanks to the man who labor of their children, but that's another topic of conversation. But my parents have this lush house, and they knew the fire was a risk, and so they were watering. I mean, they have an immaculate lawn. It's just beautiful. It's lush and green, and there's several acres around there that they've manicured and created. I think they're feeling pretty good. Now, as the person who studies fire brands, what did I do? I went up on the roof. I blew off leaves. I went around outside their home where there was pieces of uh, bark dust. I doused it. And the thought I had is if a cigarette butt were to land anywhere where I went, could it start a fire? Now, for the most part, my parents are actually in pretty good shape, but there were places that they were not prepared because they had never thought about this rain of firebrands. They envisioned fire spreaders, this wall of flames come to the house. And for some homes, some communities, that's the reality, and that's how fire can spread. My home where I live also has a lot of lush green grass around. I don't worry about this wall of flames as much as I worry about firebrands coming down and starting new fires. My parents hadn't thought about it. I then went and visited some of their neighbors to try to be of help. Same story. Some had gone to great lengths. They had watered fields and pastures. I mean, I don't know if you could drive out there. You might sink in. It was so wet. But then yeah, I went up on the roofs and gutters. And there was an incredible amount of the debris that could ignite if it was firebrands. Not because they didn't care, not because they weren't thoughtful people, because they didn't know where to think. So it's on us as homeowners to educate ourselves. Some of it's intuitive and some of it we may not think of. So there's a lot of great resources out there. I think there's some great information with the National Fire Protection Agency. If you Google things like FireWise or 
make it a home fire resilient. Or I Googled what I, Coos Bay fire something just to see what's local. There's the My Southern Oregon Woodlands organization and they talk about firewise communities and they'll give you like checklists of things to evaluate. Um, there was things, I, I, I think this is very cl much closer to Coos Bay. It's amazing how many different organizations are out there and resources to help people you can contact, checklists you can go through that give you information. Much of it you'd probably, we'd all probably guess, but, but there's also probably a lot we wouldn't think about. For example, how many of us would have thought that a firebrand can go in through um, a soffit or ventilation port in a roof and go inside the attic and start a new fire? I wouldn't have guessed it. Turns out there's a fairly simple fix. It's called wire screen. And they recommend, I think it's a quarter inch screen that helps block them. Right. So there's other there's information out there that may, we may easily overlook and we just have to educate ourselves. So the third thing that I wish every homeowner knew and acted upon was have consistent audits and routines for checking problematic areas. Even the best intentions can go by the wayside when we get busy, have vacations in the middle of summer. The last thing probably I want to be doing is looking at debris. But we all live in environments that are uh, dynamic. There are leaves coming down. There's bark. We're living life. We have children, perhaps. So I'm happy to note that uh, <laughs> at least before the rains came, I did clean off my valleys and gutters, and I'm in good shape <laughs> um, if there was a fire and I was worried about firebrands coming down. Now, I want to, to say one other comment here as I wrap up. In the examples I've just given, that's all about homes that are that are near rural areas and it's easy to think well I live in a community it's not a, not going to happen to me that is a false statement um, there are many examples of communities or people that live in the middle of the community the homes get burned down especially in the last five years or so even in Oregon we've had communities where they never expected the middle of the community would burn or have issues think about Talon Oregon there's been issues in the community and Everything you talk about fire bands can happen as, as structures burn. They can form pieces of shingles or siding material can break off and come down and land. So all the steps I've gone through apply to anybody, pretty much anybody in Oregon, I think, whether you live in a city, you live in a rural town, you live in the, the wilderness, apply to all of us that we all need to be fire wise. As each person becomes more fire wise and we're more resilient, that there's a lifting effect that helps our neighbors. And even in communities, there are houses that are close together, that sort of thing. Every step we take to be safer doesn't guarantee safety, but it helps the entire community. And if we all take steps like this to make sure fire wise, so that if our neighbor house in the corner catches fire, you know, what can we do to make sure that fire brands can't rain in our house or there can't be fires that start next to my house? Um, so every, the caution I've given apply to frankly, all of us. Okay, so hopefully I've addressed those goals tonight. Um, whole slew of acknowledgements that I said at the very beginning. A lot of people have make this work possible. Um, I get to give the presentation, hopefully be a little entertaining and provide something new, but these are really the people that did the work or, or certainly they provided the funding. Um, there's a sprinkling of references throughout there. Those aren't correct. And with that, I'd love to answer any questions or, or comments if, if you have critiques. <laughs> Well, thank you, David, for starters. Um, so our fire science faculty member, Erica Weisner, uh, she's a wildland firefighter, second year engine boss, uh, and she sent me a few different questions. I'm gonna start with one of them. How big a deal are fire whirls? And maybe for those of us uninitiated, a little bit more about what a fire whirl is. Yeah, so think about a fire whirl essentially as a, a, um, a tornado a tornado that sets up in the in a fire and it whirls around and then it can help spread that that fire how um so then her question is as we'd say how big of a deal are those i don't have a sense about the frequency of those um and i and frankly i haven't studied them but i certainly would expect that when they occur they could be a big deal <laughs> so that that's uh, that's what i know uh, another thing that she was asking, is flame length height a good predictor of fire brand lofting and spotting distances? How about wind speed or column height? 
Yeah, great question. So uh, for the reference here, so the question is the fire length. So one of the parameters is if you look at the height of where these flames are, it's a fire length. And that's been in the fire community, that's been a great or frequently used as an indicator of, of the intensity of the fire and how much heat is being released. It's, you can take a picture of it and you can quantify that without having to have ex expensive in instrumentation, that sort of thing. And we did work, um, we did some work trying to correlate our results to that very question about um, the fire length. And, and frankly, we, we didn't take it all the way. And I, and I forget what the issue was, um, if we just didn't feel as comfortable about our analysis or, or not. Um, so I don't have an answer specifically about that. But what we did have studied more recently is we varied um, the fuel and tried to see how that influences our, our burning behavior. And, oh, I'm trying to memorize our results. Those, those are some of our most recent results. That, and I, uh, we haven't run up yet. Um, so, and there's limitations in this. What we did is we took our straw and then we put uh, different amounts of diesel fuel on it. And that didn't change our flame length that much, but it changed the amount of time that it burned. Oh, and if my memory's correct, I think it, it, I don't think it made a big difference in number of fire brands, but I, I could be wrong. I'd have to double check those results. You can email me if you have, if you have questions, but um, I'm pretty sure if it made a, a very large difference, I, I would remember that. So, mm -hmm. and there were some other questions about wind. Um, is that right, Ron? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was embedded in the flame length, wind, speed, or column yeah. height. Yeah, the so our, our lab scale studies over where we'll go up to six meters per second suggest that wind doesn't have a big influence within our what we studied. But, but there has to be a, um, a threshold in which wind becomes important. And we haven't identified that. So I think wind could be the wild card. And certainly if it's very windy, it, it's just easier for things to break off. So we haven't wrapped our mind or our arms around it, but I, I think it's going to be important. Mm -hmm. And I think a number of the questions basically you answered in the in the body of the of the talk, especially with probability and the, the species control. Uh, one of the things uh, that I think uh, also is out there that, that she mentioned, and I'm going to do this more from a, uh, a homeowner thing. Uh, do you know of any yeah. trees or shrubs that are particularly fire resistant? Yeah. There are species in Mother Nature that are designed to survive wildfires. Um, but that depends on the species, but also the size of the species. For smaller, like shrubs and bushes um, that are woody, I, I, could, I don't know which ones I would necessarily recommend. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a good answer for that, <laughs> unfortunately. I, I know there are, but I don't know kind of what we plant for that size of brush. I don't know what, what we'd use. So I'd like to go back to kind of your initial, one of your initial takeaways, that knowing that there are some community college students and also potentially uh, some middle school and high school students out there, if they're thinking about going on in either engineering in your department or any of the STEM fields, what would you suggest as some of the crucial uh, coursework that they should be, and other things potentially, that they should be focusing on now at either the middle school, high school part of their career or the first two years of undergrad? So in high school, um, if you gravitate towards the STEM fields, I would encourage you um, just to have a broad STEM background. I mean, certainly, you, you know, you can narrow down and say, well, I'm going to be an engineer, I'm going to take physics, and, and, and that's great. But I, I think it help, having a strong background, having uh, strong fundamentals in math is helpful, but maybe more important is being willing to work hard. 
Um, I certainly don't think that everyone does who does engineering has to be great necessarily at math, great at physics or all those things. Um, some of our best engineers probably are just by brute force, right? But they, they can become fantastic engineers. Once you get into um, college, one of the things that I feel very strongly about is that it's um, so important to get involved early in an exposure to your field. And so what I mean by that is look for clubs or organizations that interest you and that will give you experience on what it means to be an engineer or maybe a physicist or something like that. Unfortunately, a lot the way a lot of the curriculums are set up, it's not really until a junior year that a student really becomes doing what we envision as engineers. And I think we lose a lot of students that process. But the flip side is the more experiences students have doing the engineering or being exposed to it, I think the more qualified they are when they graduate and the more likely they are to, to succeed and, and, and move through. And have fun. All right. That sounds great. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join us this evening and also for everybody else. Hopefully uh, we will see many of you back on November 9th when we talk a little bit about paleomagnetism and its relation to, uh, to climate. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Have a great week and we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thanks, everybody.